Welcome everyone to the ANS webinar on identifying researchers. Well, we have two special guests today. We have Jim Blake and Chris Westling from Cornell University. Uh, Jim is the software release manager for Vivo and Cornell. He has been involved in implementation of Vivo in Cornell University and he has a great deal of experience in interoperability between research profiles in Cornell and other universities. Our other speaker today is Chris Westling from Cornell. Chris is a data analyst for a Cornell Vivo project with a great experience in authorless ambiguation, dealing with the dirty data, and aggregating data about researchers from different sources in the university. Despite the time zone difference, Jim and Chris kindly accepted our invitation to join us in this webinar uh, from a Cornell Ithaca campus. If I'm not mistaken, it is 8 p.m. now it is in Ithaca. So and a special thanks to Jim and Chris for accepting Anne's invitation. Uh, before I start the discussion, just a quick housekeeping business. Uh, Chris and Jim are uh, connected to the webinar through one account. Uh, so they are actually and attending this to the one session that is from the Chris Westling account. Some of the speak that's that's what is going to be visible. And uh, they are also not the only people who are from the United States. I am also connected to this webinar from uh, New York, although I'm actually in a different place. And we did a test yesterday. Unfortunately, the internet connection that I'm using is not that good. So if there uh, will be any uh, unexpected drops in the connections, Alex is going to pick up the session. Now, let's get to the main discussion about identifying researchers. In the last uh, few years, a lot of Australian research institutions went through the process of implementing the research profile management systems and platforms. A common observation that we had was uh, the, the problem and the challenge of linking the researchers to their publications, grants, and uh, research data. Uh, it, is, it is a common problem across many of these projects. Uh, it is not uncommon that you see the researchers have similar name. Uh, also, researchers often move across different institutions. In some cases, researchers have multiple records in the individual institution. So all of these inconsistencies and duplication in records cause uh, a great challenge for creating a seamless, seamless profile management system for researchers uh, that shows the outcome of the research for the individual researchers and also for the university in general. I initially met uh, Jim in a Vivo conference in Melbourne and they had an interesting discussion about the problems that Cornell had uh, when uh, these guys working on the project, and then Jim was involved in implementing Vivo in Cornell. Uh, what was interesting to me was, although Cornell had different approach to creating a profile system for the researchers, uh, the similarity between and the experiences that uh, Cornell had and our experiences in Australia was very close. So, uh, with this introduction. Uh, I am actually handing over this uh, presentation to Jim. Uh, thanks, Jim, for joining with us in this presentation. Okay, thank you, Amir. Let me see if I can uh, get through the technical aspects of going into slide share mode. Yeah, I think we've got there. Uh, I'd like to say good morning to everyone, or as we in the States like to say, good evening. Um, Amir mentioned how we met, and, and uh, he heard some talk that I ha uh, gave about uh, Vivo and about some of the issues that we had. And when he suggested that it would be nice for me to talk to your group, I had to confess to him that much of my information had come from an interview that I had had with Chris Westling to prepare for that very conference. So rather than have me try to tell you what Chris told me, we decided that we could both share this. Um, I want to give you a little bit of context as to where Vivo came from and uh, what our situation is, which, as Amir mentioned, in some ways is very similar to yours and in other ways may be very different. So a little bit about who we are, where we came from, and then we'll get into the question of 
dealing with issues in data, and we'll save some time at the end for questions and answers. Vivo is a research networking application, and it uses semantic web technologies uh, to store its data. It uses the semantic web technologies from the inside out. Uh, so we keep all our data in what's called a triple store. Uh, we make all our data available uh, to data requests using what uh, is called linked open data. And again, the, the raw data is just available for people to query or for other applications to query. And in between there, we also have a front end on the data that is our web application and that displays it for people. We include an editor. And again, in speaking to some of the folks in Australia, I found that the editor was of little interest to some people since uh, they ingest all the data and don't allow individuals to edit it. Uh, we have a mixture of both, some data which we ingest and don't allow others to edit, uh, and then other pieces of information such as a person's preferred title, which we let them go in and change on their profile if they choose to. So we have the data itself, we have the editor, we have the access point, uh, what I've heard called a data publisher, so that other applications on campus or elsewhere can use the data, and that's what uh, uses that linked open data protocol that I mentioned earlier. Uh, one application that uses that is a multi-site search application where many Vivo sites are all, their data is all collected into a single search index. A nice thing about that is that rather than your usual federated search where you might come back with six results from Cornell, three results from Harvard, et cetera, and then see these separate lists. Because we have them all, we've harvested that data from the various vivos, we're able to rank the results across the entire set of data rather than at each individual institution. Uh, I mentioned Harvard, and that actually brings me to my next point, and that is that we have this shared open platform. Open, of course, you know about open source software, and Vivo is open source. But the other aspect is that we have this open data interchange format called the Vivo ontology. Uh, I know I've been working on this project too long when someone starts talking about cancer doctors, and I think they're talking about ontologists, that is, people who deal with the structure of data. So perhaps it's time for me to take a vacation, but right now, I'll continue here to say that the Vivo ontology is a way of structuring the data, a way of identifying relationships among the data, so that instead of saying that a person is the instructor of a class or has an instructor role in a class, we would say teaches a class. Actually, that's probably incorrect since I'm not an ontology specialist, but the point I'm trying to make is that we agree on what that relationship will be called. So then Harvard Profiles, which is not a Vivo software, but is publishing their data using the Vivo ontology, will use that same terminology to express the same relationship, and so it can be accessed by any application that can access Vivo data. We're also seeing other applications uh, taking up the Vivo ontology so they can be part of that shared data community. Oh gosh, Vivo started a long time ago in a small village on top of a hill outside of Cayuga Lake in upstate New York. Um, it's a little difficult for me to talk about the history since the fellow who originally created Vivo is sitting here beside me, prepared to frown at anything I might say that is incorrect, including that apparently. Um, it was devoted strictly to the uh, College of Agriculture, which became the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here at Cornell. And as it expanded out to other disciplines, uh, people who were using Vivo, developing Vivo, etc., publicized Vivo, went to uh, conferences, presented papers, and that sort of thing. I spoke with Simon Porter of University of Melbourne, and he said, 
we found that we had to do research networking and when we started to develop our own application we heard about Vivo and realized these people have done two-thirds of our work for us and so the Melbourne folks are now using Vivo if you go to their find an expert site that's all Vivo in under the in under the bonnet bonnet or hood in Australia Not sure. never sure never sure uh, in 2009, uh, we received a grant from the National Institute of Health and, uh, in, in the States here and uh, ramped up the, the development team. Uh, we added features and functionality to the application, but also one important thing we did is sort of did our best to turn it into a product. So the people who adopted uh, Vivo early on, University of Melbourne, Griffiths, uh, also um, University of Florida here and Indiana University, they were all sort of leading edge people willing to hack their way through the wilderness and figure out how to use it. In order for Vivo to, create, to gain a wider acceptance, we needed to package it more nicely, we needed to have instructions, we needed to have workshops, we needed to have a conference where people could come and talk about Vivo. We needed to have implementation instructions and mailing lists and all those outreach aspects that build a community of people using Vivo. We were very much aware, and so was the National Institute of Health, that they weren't going to fund us forever. And so part of our goal became to create a self-sustaining uh, Vivo project. I suppose it remains to be seen whether we've done that successfully, but our next step has been with the end of the NIH grant to affiliate ourselves with DuraSpace, which is a not-for-profit corporation that uh, handles software products such as Fedora Commons, the repository software, also DSpace repository software, and a couple of other pieces. And they thought that we were aligned very nicely with their market space and that they were wanting to start an incubator program at DuraSpace and looking for that first project. Well, how nice that was because we were looking for someone to relieve us of the necessity of creating a not-for-profit corporation, of figuring out all the legal aspects of that. And uh, DuraSpace has been very helpful to us in that regard and also in sharing the expertise that they've developed over the last several years uh, of working with an open source product. Just got a little map here just pointing out the various sites of the universities and colleges that were involved in the uh, uh, National Institute of Health grant and uh, this is our sort of uh, bragging map of uh, how many Vivo implementations there are worldwide, uh, there are lies inherent in this map. One of them is that many of these implementations are not in production. People who are working to prepare Vivo for use at their, their institution. So you see uh, five locations in Australia and two in New Zealand. Uh, I'm not sure how many of those actually are up and running and of the three dozen or so in the states, I think we have about a dozen that have a public facing persona. Others are very close to it, others still are just experimenting. We also see the uh, different colored, this is the second lie, uh, the red flag, the yellow flag, uh, the red flag represents a Harvard profile system. As I mentioned earlier, they're using the Vivo data structures, but not the Vito, Vivo software itself. Uh, the yellow flag represents a Loki implementation and they're in a similar situation. And I believe somewhere in the upper right corner of the states there should be a tip of another red flag there to represent Harvard itself. It's a little cluttered over there. So Vivo does three things. Well, is used in three things. One is gathering data. One is providing an opportunity for us to review and edit the data, and finally to uh, dispense the data, to uh, make it available through the web application itself, and also to make these feeds available to other websites on campus and across the network. 
just a little glance at, at what Vivo Cornell looks like, a couple of pages here. We have people in the system. We have faculty members, and if I were to break that down into emeritus faculty and current faculty and adjunct faculty, we have non-faculty members, librarians, etc. Um, we have organizations within Cornell, each individual college within the Cornell and some departments or um, what would you say, laboratories, research projects. And of course we have the research, pages and pages and pages of journal articles, of books, of uh, grants, of posters that were delivered at conferences, papers that were delivered at conferences. This is the meat of the system. And and Amir assures me that this is the meat of yours as well. I hope I got that right. Yes, you did. Um, so, some quick statistics. Uh, I'm reminded of a very excellent book that was published in the late 1950s entitled How to Lie with Statistics. Okay. And I'm about to do just that because Vivo lies to me. And this is where I'm, I'm, I'm leading into Chris's part of the presentation. So although I can say, well, Cornell Vivo uh, holds 138,000 distinct information resources, I'm not sure that they actually should be distinct. Um, we have 93,000 persons in our Vivo system. Of those, about 11,000 are actual uh, Cornell persons that we know about, and others may be co-authors on the papers that they have written. Uh, so they appear in vivo, uh, co-investigators on the grants that uh, Cornell uh, faculty uh, are investigators on, and so they appear in vivo as well. And once again, although we can say that 11, th or I'm sorry, the 81,000 are unknown persons, they may in fact represent fewer than 81,000 people, since we have trouble making sure that each person is represented only once. How am I doing here, Chris? That's, that's just about right, Jim. Um, I'll, I'll jump in and say that, the, I'll back up just a second, that the takeaway here is that one in eight people in Cornell Vivo is not real. Um, <laughs> the idea that uh, we have quite a few of these uh, unknown persons or co-authors that have come in and have been generated with a unique ID that represent a co-author in the world somewhere, and it may represent one of our Cornell researchers, but we're just not sure. This is the point at which our machine dis disambiguation kind of falls down for us. Um, briefly, I'm going to go ahead and and, uh, and jump in here. I'm a data analyst at Vivo at Cornell, and my day-to-day -day job is sort of the care and feeding of, of Vivo. Um, I work as part of the implementation team. Uh, we've got about five or six people that we work with. Um, my boss, you might say she's a Vivo evangelist. She takes uh, Vivo out to the faculty and the administration on campus and makes sure that uh, everyone understands what's going on as best they can. Uh, we have a full-time programmer, um, and the duties of myself and another part-time editor kind of comprise the cleaning and the day-to-day uh, -day maintenance of Vivo. Um, we employ a number of student workers to help us with the hard lift, the heavy lifting, and uh, we do have part of an interface design specialist and a web designer. So um, there's quite a few people that make Vivo go. Um, this is how it looks. Um, in this particular case, we're going to focus today, really basic example. Um, this is our friend Anthony Ingrafia. He's a, an engineer, specifically a civil engineer. And if we had the time to get him know him better, we'd understand that he's interested in the way things break apart. He's interested in stress fractures and cracks in things. He's a materials scientist. And as we go down through this example, I'm going to go show you uh, the, the parts of which that becomes kind of important as we go through. So this is his Vivo profile page, we like to call it. It's got information about his positions, um, some, some basic detail about his research area. But down here, uh, along the bottom row, we have tabs that would take us out to his publications or the courses that he teach, uh, give us more information about his uh, service to the university, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about Vivo is that we can click on this little link icon in Anthony's profile and we can see this URI or Uniform Resource Indicator. 
this is Anthony's unique identifier in vivo. This is how we refer to him. And it looks like a web address when in fact it is. If we were to put this into a browser, it would resolve this same page and show us Anthony's smiling face here. But one of the interesting things we could do is click on this view profile in RDF format and we get something that remarkably uh, does not look like a web page. Um, that's because this is RDF or Resource Description Framework. This is the um, the stuff that makes Vivo go behind the scenes. And we can take a look in here. This is not designed to be intimidating, but we can see different things like Anthony's middle name is R, and he has some research areas. He's also known as the Dwight C. Baum Professor of Engineering. So if we go ahead and skip forward, we can talk about RDF triples. I'm going to give you the most basic of introductions here. Um, tri RDF triples are made up of subject, predicate, an object. In this case, we see Anthony's unique identifier, his URI, and then we can look over here to see that this, this predicate gives him a label, and the label is just a plain English way to describe his name. We also have predicate for his last name, his first name, his middle initial, and a net ID, which we use as an internal identifier. Um, the idea here is that the semantic web kind of gives you the data structure behind the scenes. The idea is that instead of looking at an HTML web page with Anthony's information, we can also get back these triples, this RDF, and do different things with it. Um, the neat thing about RDF is that you can describe people and things and just about anything in vivo with however much information you need. If Anthony didn't have a middle name, for instance, there are plenty of people who don't, um, we'd, we'd omit this particular triple and it wouldn't exist in Anthony's record. Um, if indeed he had uh, additional uh, information that we wanted to put in, we just add the triples for those and we could move on. And again, as Jim mentioned earlier, the ontology is really the way in which you describe your data and you can customize the ontology in vivo to sort of fit your data needs. Um, again, this is not meant to be intimidating, but this kind of shows you the relationship between things in vivo. Over here is a person, and it's related to an academic article. So we might imagine that this is Anthony over here, and here's an article that he authored. We carry information about the article, um, specifically the, uh, the pagination information, the title of the article. We also might contain, uh, we also might um, continue to, uh, to track information about the journal that article was published in. Um, all of this is done through RDF and these relationships between things. Um, in this particular case, it's all done through a central authorship that uh, links both ways to the person and the article. Um, moving to data ingest, uh, this is a diagram that basically shows all of the different inputs and outputs to Vivo, Vivo being this blue bar in the middle. Over here we see things like um, HR data coming from PeopleSoft and OSP, uh, our Office of Sponsored Projects is the, uh, the entity that disgorges all of our grants information. Um, and then faculty reporting system, which is where we get much of our data. We also push data out of Vivo. Um, we populate a number of websites across campus with the data that's in Vivo and we do that via the same RDF that we use to generate our web pages. Um, the takeaway from this is that data ingest is complicated. We do have uh, a lot of resources put forth into this uh, effort and uh, it's been a long road, um, but we're doing pretty well as far as the, uh, the ingest is concerned. Um, just a couple of quick bullet points. One of the early um, ingests that most new Vivo implementers get uh, introduced to is Harvester. It was originally developed by University of Florida as part of the uh, National Institute of Health grant. Um, it does a really great job with PubMed and other flat file data formats, um, and it's normally the, the kind of the first uh, method of ingest that many people use when they're getting used to Vivo. Um, while Cornell Medical College uh, is affiliated with uh, Cornell University in New York, and uh, the folks at the National Agricultural Library at USDA collaborated together to make a uh, an ingest process that utilizes Google Refine now. Uh, now called Open Refine. Um, here at Cornell, we use several different custom processes. Most of those have been the result of four or five years worth of uh, trial and error in programming. Um, 
In our particular case, we use a custom process for our internal faculty reporting. Um, we leverage uh, a product called D2R to prop up flat files and uh, CSV sheets so that we can query them much in the same way that we do Vivo. And um, there's a lot of resources and energy that go into creating the, the, the weekly data ingest for Vivo. Um, we have weekly processes that almost all run automatically. Um, and most notably, our HR process is in flux because of HR's uh, recent change to a different system. We, we now have to go ahead and rebuild our, our HR ingest from scratch. Chris, um, can I just ask sure. uh, whether HR is known? We, we, that's our term for human ah. resources or personnel. Very good. I don't know how widespread that is. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. That's nice. Um, our programmer, Joe McInerney, has worked long and hard on uh, algorithms that will take the ingested data and match them to things in vivo. Uh, this process of disambiguation mostly relies on data from name parts, uh, last name, first name, middle initial, and any other identifying uh, material that we can find, unique identifiers, um, researcher IDs if they're available. Uh, whatever can't be matched through that ingest process gets minted in vivo with a brand new identifier. Um, so if I'm unable to match a particular person or author or co-author in the ingest process, I'll go ahead and create a new person in vivo and give him a brand new identifier. And that's about, uh, in, in a nutshell, is, is how we get up to 81,000 people in vivo. Um, we're able to go then through and clean that up. Um, we've got some custom tools that we do use to do that. Uh, the relationships between the data allow us to go in there pretty quickly and um, and help clean that up. Um, the, the takeaway here is that human intervention is always part of this equation. Um, at the end of the day, even the best uh, disambiguators can, can really hit about 80, 85 percent, and there's still quite a lot left over for, uh, for humans to uh, to get involved with. We'll jump back into Anthony's profile here and I'll give you a real quick tour uh, it, it, to a specific problem that came up. This is real world stuff. Um, here's Anthony's RDF again. Again, we're describing his last name, his first name, his middle initial, and a net ID for him, which is our identifier internally. Um, if we looked at Anthony's publications, we're going to see evidence of the fact that he's uh, interested in that idea, keywords like fracture and crack formation, fatigue show up a lot in his papers here. Um, and so these are our academic articles that he's published and as we bring more information in for Anthony, uh, occasionally we have authors and co-authors that get generated that may indeed be a match for him but the machine wasn't able to, the, the, the ingest process, that is to say, wasn't able to go ahead and fix that up for us. Um, this is a, an excerpt from URI tool, which is a, a, a custom process that we developed here at Cornell to help us sort these things out. Um, more often than not, when we look at these cleanup strategies, the idea is we want to present this information in a useful way that a human person can understand and help clean up rather rapidly. In this case, what I did was I searched in vivo for all persons, uh, all person elements that matched uh, by their last name. So in this case, what we're looking at is all 93,000 people in vivo. Of that, we have these five that are uh, together by virtue of the fact they have the last name in Graphia, the same as Anthony. Up here at the very top, we see that uniform resource indicator, that URI or a unique identifier for Anthony. So we know that this guy at the top here is the real Anthony and Graphia. Um, we look at this one, we can see why the machine didn't match this. A last name and a first initial really isn't enough to match him definitively with Anthony R. This could be Alice or Andrew, but what we want to do is figure out whether indeed this article is published by Anthony. Um, we can throw these next two out pretty quickly. Uh, first initial J and first name Janet are not going to be a match for Anthony. Um, and in this particular case, it's just an offset of the, the way in which I've asked for this query. The machine was able to determine that these don't match Anthony, but in fact they may match, uh, maybe a match for one another. And down here we have this in Graphia T. We'll also take a look at that as we go forward. Um, what's also interesting to note here is we have that 
unique identifier, our internal identifier, and NetID for both of these folks. So uh, that helps us figure things out. We'll look first at this in Graphia A. We can look down at the academic articles that generated this unknown person. And we can see that material damage, uh, welded beam column, moment connections, fracture, toughness, these two publications, if we were to look a little deeper, we'll find indeed belong to our friend Anthony. So we'll go ahead and uh, plan to merge those in. If we go to the next one, however, this is the Engraphia first initial T that we saw a moment ago. And this conference paper doesn't really mention anything in Anthony's particular um, speciality. Um, so what we need to do is go just a little deeper. Uh, the way in which we normally do that is we follow the publication reference. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to dig deeper into the paper. We're going to look at the title up at the top. We can see all of the co-authors for this paper, and we know that Jerry Gay is a researcher that we know here at Cornell. Uh, we could tell, right, in this particular view by the fact that uh, Jerry's first name is the only one of all the co-authors that exists. Um, but we happen to know that Jerry input the information for this, and she also went ahead and typed in the uh, information for her co-authors here. But what we really want to know, is this our, uh, our author? Can we find out more about this? And um, most of the time, the deal breaker for these sorts of things is a manual Google search. Um, we also have uh, unique library access here and, and can reference a number of databases. And in this particular case, the first hit uh, for this title is um, the ACM. We're going to also note that the next two hits uh, are Vivo. And so uh, another example of why Vivo is a really good uh, search engine for the, the sorts of things that, that we're, we're, uh, we're looking at. If we click here, we're going to be able to note that it'll take us to the ACM Digital Library, and we can see unequivocally that this paper was authored by Jerry Gay and Anthony and Graphia. What's happened here behind the scenes uh, when Jerry and Anthony get together socially, she calls him Tony. And so when she went to put in this reference, um, she typed in his first initial T uh, pursuant to the um, particular citation guidelines that she was using. Um, so we can say unequivocally that this is the right author for the paper. And we'll pop back into our custom tool to merge these up. And all we're doing here is we're picking the first real Anthony and Graphia, the Syngraphia A, which we've deduced is a good match, and the Engraphia T. We'll pick all of those together. We might also decide to put Tony's uh, nickname in here. And when we merge those, what happens is we get the same RDF back, but we've also extended a little bit to use this also known as ontology that we developed. Um, in this particular case, the first name might also be uh, T or Tony. Um, we also might use the uh, initial A to describe um, Anthony at that point. Uh, this allows us to put additional information on top of um, the, the stuff we already have, the authoritative information, and it helps us at disambiguation time. The next time we run across a, a T in Graphia in our ingest, we're going to go and take a look at um, it doesn't mean that it's a match outright, but it allows us to go ahead and say maybe there's a probability that um, Anthony and Tony are the same person. Um, the challenge is that the problem never really goes away. And in this case, we've got another record in the system. Um, and the problem here, of course, is the last name isn't in Graphia, it's in Graphia, period. And so dirty data sometimes gets in the way. We can easily merge this one because we know that Anthony's involved in uh, uh, methane and shale gas uh, hydrofracturing stuff. But um, the challenge here is that uh, we, we, with dirty data, we never really escape the, the work that we need to do. Um, and it also goes back and, and relates those. Uh, I'm just I'm just wondering, uh, have the slides been advancing uh, appropriately, uh, Alex or Amir? Uh, yes, the slides are fine. Yes, we have a, a very, very good both, both voice and the slides are. Okay, I'm sorry. A little technical uh, glitch here made me wonder. <laughs> okay, so we'll pick up here and um, talk about how we deal with things when they don't go our way. 
Um, these are uh, sort of flippant um, policy choices that we came up with and the actions that we decide to use. Um, the idea here is that in most of the cases where something is bad, we really want it to be fixed in the source data. We don't want to make edits in vivo and then find out on our next ingest that the data coming in will overlay the changes we've made. What we're really interested in doing is asking people nicely to go to the sources of record and change the data there so that when we do our ingest next time, we'll be able to get the right information in the right place. Um, the idea is there's also varying levels of uh, incorrectness <laughs> and uh, some um, changes are more important than others and so we do often go ahead and make changes inside Vivo but often we go ahead and um, flag those so that they're not automatically clobbered by a, an ingest process. Um, so to kind of sum up, the idea is that we believe that Vivo is uniquely uh, well suited to to deal with this issue of disambiguation. Um, without taking you too far down the technical rabbit hole of disambiguation and ingest, what we found is that it's a lot faster and a lot easier to clean these sorts of things up and get good matches in vivo than it would be in a relational database. Um, we also recognize that as we continue to clean up and uh, manually match these things, the information that you get from Vivo may actually be cleaner than the source data. Um, and what that means is that we can help the folks that provide us with information clean their information at the source and make the world a better place for data. Um, <laughs> the idea, too, that the interconnectedness, which is a tough word, but the, 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 the physical idea that we have a satellite campus at Weill Cornell and a, a campus here at Ithaca, um, we're working back and forth bidirectionally to go ahead and keep our data in sync and, and make sure that we have the right information about one another. Um, that's also a challenge in, in respect that it's not easy to do. Um, some of the problems that we bump up against, uh, and I, I mentioned it earlier, we always are going to need a human eyeball on our data, uh, even the best of the disambiguation uh, information we've come up with just just really doesn't do it for us um, and we don't expect that to change what we've done is uh, you know done the best we can uh, with our matching algorithms and then we recognize that there's a certain amount of human input that needs to happen um, we have lots of dirty data it comes from all corners of the earth and we're constantly looking out for uh, things that break our ingest process or things that throw a wrench in the work um, and one might argue that the original owner of the data, the researcher uh, themselves, holds the key to all of this information. If we could just go ahead and ask them whether or not um, that, that's their publication, um, we'd find out a lot of information. But that has its own set of challenges. We recognize that moving forward, um, as the, the user base sort of matures in the digital age, we're finding different ways to, uh, to, to reach out to our researcher community and involve them in the process. Um, one of those is researcher IDs like ORCID uh, or the Scopus IDs or um, even PubMed ID uh, when that becomes a uh, reality. The idea that they will help us push people together but they don't really solve the problem for us. Um, all things being equal, uh, Vivo is, is really sort of a, a pleasure to work with and uh, to help uh, collate information in a novel and interesting way. It's also allowing us to push this information back out into the world in the form of linked open data. And one of the things that we strive to do is make sure that our information is as correct and complete as we can make it so that we're not putting uh, disinformation back into the world. Um, and with that, we have a few minutes left. Um, if we can uh, answer any questions. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Jim. That was a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, I, uh, the way that I know this works is that actually you can, uh, anyone can put the question into the question box. Uh, if you do that, I will uh, unmute you so you can actually uh, start a conversation. Oh, okay.
Sure. And, and the other option is that you can actually raise your hand. While we're waiting for this, uh, Chris, I personally have a question. You mentioned about the whole process of uh, uh, basically uh, this auto disambiguation to the tools that you have. Uh, can you give us some information about how many uh, working staff are involved in that part, either from the uh, library or from the research admin office? The number of staff that are involved? Yes, basically I try to actually figure out how much uh, uh, manual work is involved and how much you guys put effort to that part. Hmm. Um, it might be accurate to say that depending on the task, what happens is our, our, our varying priorities for um, data cleanup and integrity uh, sort of have us moving around quite a bit. Um, we tend to uh, work with the individual colleges. Each of the colleges has a, uh, a librarian after a fashion and they're a, an advocate for for Vivo in that particular field that understands the intricacies of working with those researchers. Um, so there's a, a, a person that's uh, at the at the researcher level and that helps um, direct that information and those endeavors to get cleanup done. Um, there are two of us here at um, Cornell that in our in our department that handle this sort of task full time. Um, and as I said, there's a number of student workers that come and go. Um, to do the really uh, heavy duty tasks of going in and translating someone's uh, CV into uh, fielded publications with all the, the trimmings and, and doing that same detective work to go out and make sure that we have the right title and the right authors. Um, so I would say, you know, offhand there's probably seven or eight people that at any time are working on this task at Cornell and at some level we're making this information more visible and so even though I said that it's sometimes difficult to involve the researcher um, information is being disseminated about our, our people and so it's out there in the world when an, uh, uh, an, an author reaches out to us via um, you know help email or gives us a phone call and says hey the information that you have for me in my Vivo profile is not correct we jump on that immediately and clean it up for them. Um, the idea is that we're, you know, committed to doing the best we can and representing our, our faculty and, uh, and academic staff the best way we know how to. Yeah, I think you kind of touched my second question on this one. The feedback system that you have from the researchers, uh, is there any mechanism inside Vivo or do you have any procedure in Cornell for the researchers to, act, to approach you and say, look, well, the information that you have is not correct? Yeah, the... Um, the channels in which changes get made uh, depend on the type of researcher that we have. There are a number of people who are uh, part of our internal faculty reporting system and as such we get every piece of information, almost every piece of information uh, from that system for them in vivo. Um, so what we do is encourage them if they want to make a change we want to have them go back to that faculty reporting system and make the changes there. So when we do the ingest, uh, that information comes forward. For the other folks at Cornell, we do allow them to do uh, a certain amount of their own data entry. Uh, we have a single sign-on. You can go ahead and edit your own Vivo profile. Um, it's not clear to us how many people take advantage of that, but we do know that there are quite a few people that are managing their Vivo identity by virtue of the fact that it's um, relatively high profile. Uh, search engines like us. They like RDF and the semantic web and uh, our information tends to rise to the top of a, a search engine search and um, we're finding more and more that the people are finding out uh, where their data is in vivo and, uh, and asking for help. Yeah, if I can just touch on that also, um, uh, Chris had a slide there about what do we do when the data is wrong and sometimes we, we both change it in vivo and we change it in the system of record as well. And part of the reason for that, again, talking to uh, the folks at Melbourne and you know they're re-ingesting this from their systems of record every day. Uh, we're not able to keep that kind of schedule because of the amount of manual correction that has to go into this data. And so rather than just say, 
uh, you know, go to the the uh, faculty reporting system and, and fix it there. Sometimes we say, well, you should do that, but we will fix it in vivo right now so that you don't have to wait if it's something that is uh, is important. Uh, we don't have to wait for the next data cycle. Yep. Okay, uh, um, now that we have time, I actually will go through the questions from the audience. Uh, uh, Christian has a question. I actually, I, uh, the best way I will approach this is I will unmute the individual and then I'll let them to actually just ask the question. So Christian, I'll unmute you and you can actually talk. Uh, hi, Christian. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, yes, I can. Okay. Okay, um, just pasted two questions in there. Uh, one is, um, I noticed one of your slides mentioned hard won algorithms. Um, we've had a little bit of playing in that space as well, and I'd be very interested to uh, look at your algorithms if you would be able to make them public. Um, yeah, absolutely. Other, yep. Um, our programmer, Joe McInerney, has, um, is working right now on a public uh, a, a, a white paper that's going to be um, included at the Vivo conference this year. Um, and it's a, a pretty extensive example of the process that he's created to uh, bring in the uh, information that we need from our faculty reporting system uh, via a series of XSLT transforms and um, uh, some, some pretty interesting code. So uh, that's going to be available very soon. Uh, the conference is in August. And so um, we could probably uh, go ahead and, and be sure to distribute that. Um, it also would be uh, online shortly after the, uh, the conference occurs. Yeah, I know not everyone can make it to the conference, but I believe, Amir, are we expecting to see you there? Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Or well, hopefully. We'll know whether that paper is Where, in, in the conference or in Cornell? Oh, in the conference in August, St. Louis. Uh, I don't know about that. All right, well, we will try to keep in communication uh, with you, and you can coordinate requests from people like Christian who are interested in this uh, paper. Would that work? Yes, yes, it would. And that's another thing I was going to suggest is a lot of these, either the source code or ideas around this kind of work can be shared, and I think it's very efficient way that we approach these problems in a collaborative manner. So if you already have a solution for a problem, the community will be able to take benefit from this and vice versa. If we have something uh, that we learn as part of our own experience, we are more than happy to share it with Cornell. Okay. okay. Well, as, long as, as long as we have Christian unmuted, uh, why don't we take his second question? Okay. Yes. Um, it, it wasn't quite clear. Uh, maybe, maybe I didn't understand it, but when you automatically assign an author ID onto a publication in Vivo compared to getting uh, a human to look at the options for what it could be and, and manually confirm which author ID something is. Is, is anything done automatically? And, and when, is, when do you decide, yeah, this is definitely the person, 100%, I'm going to automatically, behind the scenes, use the machine to assign that author ID to the publication? Yeah, the, the best way to look at that, Christian, is that um, we have that internal um, net ID that I mentioned briefly. Uh, when that appears in the source data, that's our 100% uh, lock on, on that particular person. Um, everything else is varying levels of conjecture. Uh, even if we have complete name part match for in graphia, comma, Anthony R, um, that's a pretty good indication, especially within our closed data set, that we, we have a match for the, the, the guy we're looking for. If the name turns out to be Brown, uh, comma, John L, or um, uh, Liu, comma, H, uh, the, 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 name, the name match doesn't really mean quite as much. Um, Joe uses a, a, a sliding scale, as it were, to uh, to sort of match those up inside the algorithms that he uses. And basically, most of what we're doing right now is based on name part matching. Um, we have been uh, experimenting with co-authorship connections, um, the idea that we can uh, maybe have a higher degree of probability of a match if we do see the same co-authors uh, in certain relationships. And we're also looking at being able to do uh, keyword matching uh, based on the fact that there's keywords that exist in the article titles 
or in the abstract, uh, it may match up to the researcher's uh, keywords in Vivo. But right now, most of it is done uh, with name part matching and uh, the algorithms that Joe has set up now. Do you think you'll get to a point where without that net ID and using keywords and the uh, co-authorship that you'll be able to confidently assign an author ID or you always, even with those extra things, um, want a human to confirm them? Um, our um, accomplishments have not really uh, lived up to our expectations so far. So I think that uh, we would be reluctant to say that we're going to reach that point. Yeah, and that brings up this concept of uh, misambiguation. Um, the, the, the idea that um, if I attribute publications to the wrong person, sometimes that's uh, even worse than if I had not brought those publications in and attached them to the right person. Um, we have, in, in truth, a case where uh, uh, a person with the last name Liu, L-I-U, uh, uh, first initial H, has, uh, is, is in vivo a polymath. He, he knows uh, nuclear science. He's also a, a, a medical doctor. Um, he knows all about uh, engineering and, and maybe has a couple of papers in the arts, and it's because he's a melange of uh, several different people. Um, and so we really try hard to not lump those things together and make as many discrete decisions as we can um, and not let the, uh, the algorithm run too far, as it were, and, uh, and, and misattribute them. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks, Christian. Uh, so our, the next question is from uh, Natasha Simon. Uh, Natasha, I uh, unmute you just a moment. Um, I think we've already okay. touched a little bit on uh, uh, what you've asked. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's actually Mark Value from Griffith here. There's a bunch of us uh, sitting here uh, eagerly listening to everything. Um, we've been playing around with uh, um, feature generating feature vectors for doing disambiguation. Um, are, are there any approaches that been exploring other than string metrics um, that might be amenable to more machine learning oriented processes to disambiguation? There's been a lot of work within the community along those channels. Here at Cornell we've adopted a more cautious approach for right now. One of the things that Jim and I talked about when we decided to uh, uh, host the webinar was that um, about the time we got Griffiths online, you folks may have uh, uh, found it ahead of us <laughs> in some respects. Um, and we're always eager to talk about the possibilities. In this particular case, um, our process here is, uh, is still kind of tied to bringing data into Vivo and making those positive matches. We have done some experimentation and we know that within the Vivo community um, there are some interesting things going on but I personally wouldn't venture to say anything. John, do you want to comment? I think the only thing I would mention is that there, I mean, there certainly are entity recognition algorithms out there. Um, I think the question is we feel like we're still going past some of the low-hanging fruit and, and really trying to improve and make the best use of the information we have so that we can make a better choice about where to go next. Um, the, the other interesting thing we're, we're working on a little bit is, is the concept of using a V-card, which is another sort of common ontology similar to folk, which uh, is designed to capture information about a person, their name parts, their nicknames, their email addresses, their, their affiliations, um, and other information about them, all sort of as a cluster that, uh, of data around an object that, that is not quite the same as a person. So. Uh, it, you know, we're thinking if we can create a V card that that sort of knows that can assemble everything we know about a person in connection with one publication, and then have 20 of those, would be set up with a nice data structure for do this for doing this kind of uh, feature vectors, where essentially we'll have it in one place, and we're not kind of overloading the use of the, the person object itself, which tends to imply that we're more certain than we are about the information. And is that uh, one of the means that you're using to um, 
not have to continuously make these assertions every time you do an ingest? How do you persist the mappings over time? Uh, Maybe the best way to address that is to talk about the, um, the, the, the faculty reporting system ingest that we do. Um, I, if I understand your question correctly, what we're, we're wondering is how not to have to do the same work over and over again? Yes. Maybe you could, okay, great. The idea is that uh, that's where that also known as ontology extension comes in really handy. Uh, the idea is that let's say that we have a, a name in the source data that's clearly a typographical error. Um, we do the manual match. We know for a fact that this resource should be applied to, to a specific person in vivo. What we might do is retain that typographical error as an alternative name, and also known as, such that next time we hit upon that same typo, we can go and look for it in vivo and say, look, We've seen this typo before, and it matches to this specific person over here. Um, that's you know one way around the, the the problem, and allows us to kind of speed up our process quite a bit. Um, and there's some other things that we're looking. Does that answer the question? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, and and you maintain that in the main knowledge base so that it's uh, persisted over time. Yeah, um, one of the things that we do is uh, is divide our, our RDF up into specific named graphs, and it allows us to go ahead and um, it remove and replace information in a in a more um, structured way. Um, the RDF is RDF is really good at that. I, uh, it in theory we can pile on more and more information without really um, uh, bothering performance too much. Uh, if it's not something that the display model uses, then it remains in, in vivo in the data store until such time as it becomes handy for disambiguation purpose. Um, okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks, John and Chris. I think uh, we have the time for one last question from Dominic. So, Dominic, I'm going to unmute your microphone. You should be able now to talk. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry, this is a bit of a broader question because I'm just not so familiar with RDF. Um, I was just wondering, um, say, as you're collecting more data uh, and you discover new things about the data that you're collecting that you have taken into consideration for designing this, um, it, how difficult is modifying the ontology compared to, say, modifying relational structures? Which are I think you really, uh, uh, it's a lot easier. And, and you really touched on the, the essential difference between uh, using a triple store and using a relational structure. Uh, let, me, let me take that in two directions. Um, one is um, if we have new data, we can either um, add to the ontology in a non-compatible way or in a compatible way we can extend the ontology. So if we have a, a class of individuals in the ontology that is faculty members and we decide that we want to have honored faculty members as a subclass of that, we can do that. Uh, these By declaring honored faculty member to be a subclass of faculty member, any rules that apply to faculty member, including how they are displayed, uh, will carry through to individuals of that subclass. Uh, this is also nice because although another Vivo installation or another application that uses Vivo data will not recognize our extension, it won't know what an honored faculty member is, it will be able to tell that this individual is also a faculty member, and so it can treat it, you know, we've, we've compatibly extended the ontology. Now, it's also possible possible for us to incompatibly, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling a little bit, incompatibly extend the ontology, and we find various sites with a good reason to want to do that. So they're adding completely uh, uh, information that's completely orthogonal to the existing information, and they just have to accept the fact that 
uh, another application uh, retrieving their data will ignore those pieces of information because it cannot infer anything about them. Uh, finally, when it comes to the question of modifying the ontology compared to a relational structure, uh, let me just say that you can do it without stopping Vivo. Uh, you can go right into our ontology editor and add properties, change properties, change the parent property of a child property, uh, you know, so restructure that ontology to dramatic extent <laughs> without even stopping the application. And there again, this is really the, the essential difference between that triple store, which is uh, so open to uh, expansion or extension, and relational database where you would have to go in and redefine the nature of the tables. Yeah, have I answered your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. OK. OK, we are actually amazingly on time. So it's a sharp end of the one hour discussion. I think that's probably the time for wrapping up this. I want to uh, personally thank uh, Chris, Jim, and John for giving us this opportunity to develop this discussion. Uh, and also on behalf of ANS for all the efforts that we put toward preparing the presentation. Uh, also, thanks to the, all of you that attended the, uh, this webinar, and particularly to the uh, Christian, Mark, and Dominic for adding to the conversation with your questions. Uh, any further discussion about Vivo? I believe there is a Vivo forum that people can actually get involved in that and discuss. Uh, Chris, I forgot to actually put that address into the uh, into the slides that we had initially. So if you if you want to share any forum or discussion panel, you can send it to me, and I can forward that to the uh, and and um, mailing list. Yes, Amir. Let me just say uh, vivoweb.org. So v i v o w e b vivoweb.org. Uh, okay. That's our, our sort of home site, and we'll tell you where to find our mailing list forums, our wiki pages, our source code, um, information about the conference. That's really the front door. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.